begin with a short prayer from the Upanishads. Om Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Grityurma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Om Lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness unto light. Lead us from death to immortality. Om Peace, peace, peace. Thank you for inviting me to your beautiful campus. Um, especially thanks to Hindu Yuva for organizing this event and to Vedanta Society of uh, Iowa for participating in this event. Um, when I was asked for a subject to talk about, I always like it when you give me the freedom to choose what I want to talk about. So right now something that it really excites me and interests me is consciousness studies and its interface with uh, ancient Indian philosophy. So that's what I'm going to talk about this evening. Advaita Vedanta and consciousness. Consciousness in Advaita Vedanta. Um, so what I'll do now is I'll talk for a while and uh, then throw it open for interaction. If you have questions, uh, comments, we will interact. Consciousness, I will use the words um, a little indiscriminately, consciousness, sentience, awareness, because uh, none of them quite approximate what is meant by consciousness in Advaita Vedanta. That I hope to bring out in the course of the talk. Um, what is consciousness? Very easily demonstrated but much more difficult to uh, define. I think it was the ancient uh, medieval Christian theologian, St. Augustine, who said about time. The time, if you do not ask me, I know what it is. But if you ask me, I know not. So consciousness is a bit like that. We all know what it is. Right now you're listening to me. This is consciousness. You see, it is consciousness. These are conscious events. Uh, you think, you remember, you desire, you feel excited, you feel bored, you're awake, you sleep, dream. These are all uh, events in consciousness, somehow related to consciousness. But what is consciousness itself? That has always been a source uh, of great interest in ancient Indian philosophy. Now, why would that be? Why were ancient Indian philosophers interested in consciousness? Um, one reason is, the central reason is, in most of the ancient Indian philosophies, Sanskrit word would be darshanas, by which I mean the, the Sankhya, the Yoga, the Vedanta, the Purva Mimamsa, um, Nyaya, Vaisheshika, all of that, and the Buddhist schools and the Jaina schools, um, many of them going back to four or five thousand years. One central concern, maybe the central concern there was the freedom of the self. By what, what do I mean by that? That there is suffering and how do, do you overcome suffering? Is there a spiritual solution to suffering? That was the central concern of these different schools of thought. So the self, you or I, this was the central concern of these philosophies. And the self is always connected with, with consciousness. So to different degrees, all these ancient Indian philosophies were interested in consciousness. Advaita Vedanta perhaps more than any of the others. That's one reason I'm talking about Advaita Vedanta. Another reason is of course, my school of thought is Advaita Vedanta, so I have to put it out there. Uh, I'm not giving an entirely unbiased presentation. Uh, it will basically deal with the Advaita view of consciousness and what it is, uh, how it can give us new insights today and what it can help do to help us in our personal lives. Jumping from 5,000 years ago in ancient India to Manhattan in the 21st century. You see, right now there is a great interest in consciousness. Consciousness studies has caught on in a big way in the last 25, 30 years. Earlier, it would be surprising to know, but you know, it's interesting that scientists were not interested in consciousness. Even you, people you would expect to be interested in consciousness, psychologists, they were not really interested in consciousness. Uh, they were more interested in, you know, behavior, for example. Uh, 
Why? Because it's observable and measurable. So this is what was going on until about 25, 30 years ago. For whatever reason, there is a big burst of interest in consciousness. So consciousness studies today is a big field. Multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary. Neuroscientists, of course, are interested. Brain scientists, neuroscientists. But so are philosophers. So are computer scientists. AI people are interested in consciousness. Uh, philosophers of mind, philosophers of language. Across a wide range of uh, disciplines, people are interested in consciousness. And um, before segueing into Advaita Vedanta, I will pick my, I, I'll begin there in modern consciousness studies. There is a term, the hard problem of consciousness. Recently, I had a dialogue with, you heard of Deepak Chopra? So I had a dialogue with him in, in Manhattan. And we started the dialogue. The first thing he did was, he asked the audience, how many of you have heard of the hard problem of consciousness? And all those people who had come from the Vedanta Society, they all raised their hand. Because I've been talking so much about it, they've all heard about it. What is the hard problem of consciousness? Um, David Chalmers, a philosopher from Australia, who coined the term, the hard problem of consciousness, He's in fact, now I was surprised to discover, happy to discover that he's the head of the Mind-Brain-Consciousness Unit of NYU, New York University. What he pointed out was a simple fact which had been ignored so long. See, how is it possible for a physical system, like the brain, nervous system and brain, to generate first-person experiences, what are called uh, qualia, this is a technical term used in consciousness studies. Qualia. It's a hard problem. If you Google it, you will find a huge number of hits because it's really big now. There's even a play in uh, London where you called the hard problem of consciousness. <laughs> so qualia means subjective sensations. Just exactly what we experience. You are seeing color. You're hearing sound. This is qualia. First person experience. How it appears to you. Why should this be a problem? This is a problem because in science you observe. And what you can observe is a brain. You can observe with, with modern technology. We can now, uh, you know, fMRI scans are there. You can actually see the activities at a very subtle level in the neurons. So at the most, so you are seeing and hearing. At the most, what a scientist can go up to, a brain scientist for example, can detect certain um, firings of neurons in your brain which he might then correlate with your, with your sensations. But no more. See, what we experience when you listen to my voice or when you look at the, this beautiful room, what you experience right now are not firings of neurons. You are experiencing color, sound, sight. When you look inside, you experience thought, pleasure, pain, desire, memory. You don't experience findings, bursts of little electricity. How does do these movements in the brain, the, the neuronal firings between the different synapses of the neurons in the brain, how do they generate a first person internal experience? Are you with me so far? That nobody has any idea of. Uh, there was this talk I saw on online, presented by a top neuroscientist. And he, he, he did a lot of talks. You'll see if you, if you Google, you'll find most of them are titled Consciousness, the problem of consciousness solved. And when you go in there, it's not solved at all. <laughs> so this uh, neuroscientist had a cartoon up where a scientist is presenting the problem of consciousness, solution. Step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. So step one, two, three, four, uh, one, two, three are full of mathematics and notations. And step five is again full of mathematical notations, but step four just says miracle. <laughs> and uh, you know, the, one of the scientists who's watching that, he's uh, looking into the board, he says, I think you have to work on step four. <laughs> it requires a little more work. That's what David Chalmers has pointed out. There is simply, in principle, these two things are very different. How can a physical system, no other physical system, has an internal first person experience? Not this. Not even computers. Even the most ambitious AI person, 
might claim AI, that artificial intelligence is possible, even that is doubted, but would not claim that the machine is having internal experiences like us. No. Even computer scientists would not go so far as to claim that. But why is it happening? What is the connection? That he calls the hard problem of consciousness. Uh, David Chalmers. And obviously, many, many, many scientists do not accept it. Uh, there is, because it goes against the, the uh, ruling paradigm of science. Uh, recently in Manhattan, I was in a, what is they call a philosophy cafe. It was conducted by a professor from uh, City University of New York, who is who holds an opposite view from uh, David Chalmers' view. His view is that, give us time, we will show how the brain can produce consciousness. A brain produces consciousness just like the candle produces heat and light. So brain generates consciousness. There's nothing more to it than the brain. When the brain dies, consciousness is gone, finished. Can you demonstrate that? Can you even show in principle how it's possible? He admitted, no, we can't. But then I asked him, what prevents you from accepting that there is a hard problem? You see, very important question. That there is a hard problem of consciousness. What prevents you from accepting that? And his answer is very instructive. He said, if I have a strong Italian accent, if I accept it, then I have to change my entire paradigm, you know, entire paradigm of physics that has to be changed completely. Because you have to admit now an entirely new type of uh, reality called consciousness, which is, which is uh, not generated by um, matter and energy, by our, our understanding of physics as it is, the standard model. You cannot fit it in there. But that's what David Chalmers is proposing. He says, you cannot ultimately explain consciousness in terms of brain or nervous system. And he's proposing something called, you can catch his talks on YouTube, and his papers also are out there. Panpsychism. And he himself says, what I'm going to say sounds crazy to, to serious scientists, but maybe we have to go there. Because here is a phenomenon. Clearly consciousness is there. We all experience it. By the way, there are people who are redu strong reductionists who would be very happy to deny consciousness. Daniel Dennett, for example. Um, I mean, he's not all that strong, but there are others. I think Churchland is there, who would say that there is no such thing as consciousness. You would be stunned to hear that. So what are we, zombies? We are not conscious? There is no such thing as consciousness if did, uh, because that solves the problem neatly. Then you can be happy with the uh, existing paradigm. But that doesn't work for the simple reason that when you're talking about consciousness, you're not talking about quarks or strings or black holes. You're talking about something that is evident to everybody in the world. All of us, we have the data because that's our life. What else is our life except these first-person experiences? You see, smell, hear, touch, or touch, talk, walk, think, remember, desire. All of these are conscious experiences, are first-person experiences. How can you deny this is not there, that you don't experience it? What David Chalmers is proposing is that we may finally have to admit that consciousness is a fundamental reality as much real and as much uh, ubiquitous as matter, energy, time and space. You see the common sense that the, the ruling paradigm about consciousness is matter and energy, time and space are real and somehow matter is, uh, you know, it organizes itself into living matter and living matter, that's living bodies, life evolves into more sophisticated brains and nervous systems and those brains and nervous systems somehow, the operative word is somehow, generate consciousness. That's the mainstream, that's what we are taught in schools and colleges. What David Chalmers is proposing is that no, just like atoms, and, you know, quarks and all are fundamental, matter and energy is fundamental, Consciousness is also fundamental. It is not born of matter. It interacts with matter in us, for example. We are conscious beings, but consciousness is a fundamental reality. Present everywhere in the universe. And he says we may finally be driven to it.
because there's no, in principle, there's no way of explaining consciousness from the point, from physical matter, from matter itself. Uh, he called, this is called panpsychism. We didn't start with him. You can Google that also. Again, of course, heavy blowback on this. I asked uh, the professor from CUNY, um, what do you think about panpsychism? David Chalmers' uh, theory. And he said, oh, Chalmers, he gets one idea after the next, each worse than the earlier one. <laughs> This is not acceptable. But uh, in a very interesting interview with uh, an interview with whom? But there, David Chan says, if you think long enough about the problem of consciousness, if you seriously think about it long enough, then either you become a panpsychist, that is, consciousness is fundamental, or you go into administration. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one of the two will happen to you. He is a very humorous guy. Now, this is a place where I segue into my subject. I still haven't started though. So this is the time? The, the one, this one, right? 5.50? Good. Yes. All right. So this is where I really enter my subject. That is Advaita Vedanta and consciousness. Or consciousness in Advaita Vedanta. I am reminded of um, a book, Waking, Dreaming, Being by Evan Thompson. He is a uh, philosopher in the University of British Columbia. <coughs> he begins with a quote which even I as an Advaitin, I, I wouldn't be so bold as to say that. He begins with this quote that we, uh, he quotes another philosopher, that we are used to dating our history with you know, AD and BC, but these Upanishads, root texts of Vedanta, the Upanishads are so important and significant in human history that we should actually date our history, world history from you know, before Upanishads and after Upanishads. So what is so incredible about this, um, the Vedantic insights into consciousness? So we have to go all the way back to the early period, um, very ancient Indian history where these texts originated, Upanishads. And these, by the way, form the basis of the system of philosophy I'm going to talk about. Advaita Vedanta. Before we get into Advaita Vedanta, oh, by the way, another thing was when I was having this dialogue with Deepak Chopra, one thing he remarked just before the dialogue started, I think. He said about the hard problem of consciousness, he said, Swami, uh, there is actually, if you look at Indian philosophy, there is no hard problem of consciousness, right? And I said to him, in one sense you're right, because we have a very deep insight into this so-called hard problem of consciousness. But if you say that, then it shuts the door to all kinds of dialogue. You just come across, so someone like David Chalmers, for example, He's an atheist. He clearly says, I'm an atheist, I'm a materialist. This is just because my worldview does not explain consciousness, can, in principle cannot explain consciousness. So I am being driven to posit this. So I, I said I said to Deepak Chopra that we should uh, welcome this approach also. Instead of shutting the door by saying we have solved the problem of, um, of uh, hard problem of consciousness. All right. So what is it? What are the insights that we can talk about? Uh, from ancient Indian philosophy. See, there are four ways, broad ways, in which the whole problem of consciousness and its relationship to the objects. Basically, the structure of our experience right now and all our lives, you can think of it as consciousness experiencing objects. So you are a conscious being, a sentient being. Often, of course, Lectures in philosophy make you to the opposite. <laughs> you tune out. But you are a sentient being, a conscious being, and what are you conscious, uh, conscious about? You're conscious about the objects of consciousness, which are sound, light, uh, heat, touch, taste, thoughts, memories, all of this. Whatever you are experiencing in life. So let's call them objects of consciousness. Whatever you experience, objects of consciousness, and that which does the experiencing, you're calling that consciousness. 
what are the relationships between the two? So basically four approaches. One would be that the objects give rise to consciousness. This is the scientific paradigm. Matter, a material world, and one of its products is consciousness. That's how we, uh, we understand consciousness in a broad sense. Living matter generates consciousness somehow. That's one paradigm. And this was there in ancient India too. Uh, there was a whole school of materialists called the Charvakas. Those who studied Indian philosophy you know that. Uh, and their view was, it's matter which is primary, just come together, somehow generates consciousness. And the example they gave would make no sense to who's somebody who's not been brought up in India, would make a lot of sense to anybody brought up in India. You have heard of Pan? So the Charvakas would say, how does consciousness come from matter? If you ask the question, like the heart problem of consciousness. If you ask that question to them, and they deal with it, they, they ask this question, how does dead matter, which is not conscious, insentient, generate consciousness? They ask this question, and the answer they give is an example. They say that in a palm, um, I'm not even going to define that for those who don't know what a palm is. In a palm, when you chew it, there's nothing red in the palm, but at the end of it, your lips are red and your tongue is red. So the red color is produced by the mixture of the elements which are not red in themselves. This is a very crude example, but the point is that consciousness is generated as a byproduct of um, reactions of activities in the body which are not conscious in themselves. So that's one answer. And that's exactly the answer of modern science today, except that you can't show all that. What are the other possibilities? This is one. Um, and then there was another one, just the opposite. Consciousness generates its objects. You might say, who says that? All religions do. All theistic religions. This is the view of religion. This is just a fancy way of saying God created the universe. Right? Any religion, if you ask them, is your, uh, is your God a conscious God or non-conscious God? Conscious God, of course. So consciousness, a conscious entity, to make it more clear, created all the objects. So everything in the universe was created by an omnipresent, omnipotent, omni, uh, uh, or omniscient God. And this idea you find in the Abrahamic religions, in Judaism, Christianity, Islam, in the various theistic Hindu traditions. So Vaishnavism, Shaivism, Shaktaism, the name of the deity differs, the stories associated with the deity differ, but they all say it's a creator God. God created the universe. Basically, in our terms, consciousness created its objects. That's one. Then there's the second view. The third view is consciousness, none of them created the other, but they're all fundamental realities, nature and consciousness, they're parallel realities. So consciousness, parallel to its objects, both hands for objects. Whose view is this? This is the Sankhya Yoga view. According to this view, these are two ancient uh, schools of Indian philosophy. Some of you might go, wait a minute, yoga is it? Uh, yeah, the yoga that you see in the yoga studios, the stretching and uh, the yoga pants and uh, breathing and all of that, that's a, a, a very small, not very important part of this very ancient philosophy. Uh, the original text of which is Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. So Sankhya and Yoga, they are, they are similar Sankhya. Similar world views. And they say consciousness and matter, the exact words are uh, Purusha Prakriti. Pure consciousness and material nature are neither produces the other. They are fundamental realities and they exist. So each of us is consciousness and you interact with matter. What is matter? Body, external world of course, and your body and your brain and all of that. Much like maybe a TV program in the air interacts with a TV set. Something like that maybe. That's not an example they would have given. But, uh, and you can see, if you're quick and you know, you're following, you'll see this seems very similar to Feinstein's. It's 
almost extraordinarily similar what David Chalmers is proposing today as a possible solution to the hard problem of consciousness is actually mainstream Hindu philosophical thought. It's one of the oldest schools of, uh, of Indian philosophy. But not the only school. There are other schools also. But again, that's not what I'm going to talk about. The fourth one is what I'm going to talk about. This is the Advaita Vedanta view, where consciousness does not generate objects but appears as um, the its objects. How do I do that? <laughs> okay. This is the Advaita view. And curiously enough, there is another philosophy in Buddhism which is associated with the, you might uh, associate it with the Dalai Lama, Tibetan Buddhism. Advaita, I would say, the Dzogchen view. It's the most advanced school of Tibetan Buddhism. Both of them seem to have a similar view of reality. It is consciousness alone appearing as this world. So that's an incredible thing. It's a great reversal. Matter only generating consciousness. This is our paradigm. And Advaita seems to say just the opposite. Whatever they call consciousness, it is what is appearing as this physical universe. All right. I'll say a few things about um, Advaita next. But before that, let me just mention this book I read recently. Can you see the very radical nature of this claim? What they are claiming is, here, what they are claiming is everything is time, space, matter, and energy. Um, mainstream science. Here, what they are claiming is, in this one, this is mainstream religion. But here, what they are claiming is panpsychism that everything is okay with the standard model except that consciousness cannot be explained by the, the universe as it is. So consciousness is an uh, independent part of this universe. But here, you're doing something very radical. You're saying consciousness is the only reality. And that what you experience as a reality is within consciousness. If it reminds you of the matrix, you are not far. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not exactly that. Um, before I go there, let me mention a book I read recently. Why does the world exist? I'm trying to show that this is not such a crazy idea after all. There's a book, Why Does the World Exist? I recommend it. Jim Holt. He's a journalist in Manhattan. No, that's not the reason I recommend it. <laughs> But he is, uh, it's a brilliant book, a very interesting, sort of unput down level, but it's the biggest question that you could ever ask. Not just the word, he's basically asking why does anything, why does the universe <coughs> exist at all? Could have been nothing, or could it? And so the book is, he takes this question, he asks people like Steve Weinberg, the uh, Nobel Prize winning physicist in uh, University of Texas, he goes to Roger Penrose, the mathematician and physicist, he goes to top philosophers, he takes this question to theologians, uh, and uh, across the board, top people in their field. And he comes to, to, so it's not that, he doesn't stop at the general answers that we get. Why does the world exist? A physicist would say, Big Bang. He doesn't stop there, it goes much further. So, stuff which I, I don't at all claim to understand. Well, what were the terms? Quantum vacuum tunneling effect. So only, I think, leading edge, you know, those who are doing physics at the cutting edge of physics would know what it means. But things like that. And he comes up with a wide range of answers, including God. And, and, but you will see how in all the answers, basically these are the paradigms he has come across. And towards the very end, he comes, he's talking with Robert Nozick, a very well-known philosopher, philosopher of mind, I think. One after another, the theories are not satisfactory, this fails for this reason, that fails for the other reason. And finally, the philosopher is, inter is interviewing, says, maybe you know the Hindus are right after all, Atman is Brahman, <laughs> the Advaita Vedanta idea. And uh, Jim Holt takes it up for two paragraphs, discusses it actually towards the end of his book, and says, no, no, this is too crazy, <laughs> like, you can't stay here. Well, for the rest of this talk, we will stay with the crazy, and let's see what, what it means. Okay, I will try to explain Advaita in as 
simple a term as possible. It's a vast philosophy developed over thousands of years, especially the last 1500 years after Shankaracharya, 1400 years. Instead of going down that road, I'll make it a little experiential. The advantage of talking about consciousness is we are all conscious, unless you are a zombie, but we are all conscious. And you have the data about which we are speaking of. So it should be possible, at least in theory, to show you what Advaita Vedanta means by consciousness. So, and they say yes. The Advaita Vedanta idea of consciousness is consciousness, which they call Brahman, is the ultimate reality, the stuff of the universe basically. What we consider to be a physical reality is an appearance and, wait for it, that ultimate reality is you. You are that ultimate reality. So that sounds cool. I, mean, I, I could go live with that. The, the, the Sanskrit approximation is Brahma Satyam, Jagat Mithya, Jiva Brahma Nagara. How do they demonstrate that? Can you demonstrate that? Actually, it turns out that you can. So they have these procedures to show what consciousness is, what they mean by consciousness, Advaita Vedanta. Let's take up one of these procedures. Uh, from a medieval text called Drip Drishya Viveka, the distinction between the seer and the seen. The basic principle, operating principle, we're going to do a mind experiment now, uh, is that what you see and that which sees are two different entities. Very simple. You are looking at this pen and you'll say, uh, the eyes are looking at the pen. Clearly the eyes have to be different from the pen. I mean in a very simple physical sense. Because the only thing that the eyes themselves cannot see are the eyes themselves. You know, we normally think, what is the limit of your vision? You normally think it's out there. But it's not out there. You have a telescope, you can see things very far away. It's not even things which are tiny, because if you have micro microscopes powerful enough, you can see tiny things. But the limit of your vision, of our vision, is the eyes themselves. You cannot see the eyes themselves. You say, wait a minute, I can see that all you need is a mirror. But you can see a, 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 you can see a reflection of your eyes in a mirror, but not directly. So the way you are seeing other things, you can't see the eyes. You, you take a selfie, you can see a picture of your eyes, but not the eyes themselves directly with the eyes. So the seer and the seen are different entities. Hold on to this. We will abandon it at the end, but right now hold on to this principle. Seer and the seen are different entities. And this progresses in four stages. Stage one. Note that the eyes of the seer and what they see are, one, different from, from the eyes. Seer and the seen are different. The seer is relatively unchanging and what you see is continuously changing. You saw something else outside, something else now, later on you will see something else and so on. Same pair of eyes. So seer unchanging, relatively. Seen, changing all the time. Third, the seer is one. Means I have one organ of vision, not that I'm one eye, but the organ of vision by itself sees many, many things. The seen are many, the seer is one. The seen keep changing and the seer does not. And the seen and the seer are different. So that is first step. Are you with me so far? Second, deeper, more subtle, inwards. The eyes themselves are experienced. You know your eyes are open. You know I can't keep my eyes open, this guy is boring me so much. So you know what the eyes are, you know, you're aware, I need glasses, you know that. So the eyes themselves become the object of knowledge. They are experienced. And what is the experience of what knows the eyes? The mind. You the mind, from within you know. The eyes are open, closed, whatever. So the mind is the seer and the eyes themselves are the seen. We are at the second stage now. Apply those three principles. One is the seer and the seen are different. Is the mind, whatever it is, is it different from the eyes? Yes. Clearly. The eyes are these organs and their nervous system, whatever it is. But the mind is something clearly different from the eyes in nature. Second, the mind, remaining the mind, experiences many things, not only just the eyes, the other sense organs, uh, all of these are experienced by the same mind. The eyes, ears and so on, the rest of the body. The third one, the mind, relatively unchanging, experiences a variety of changes. 
You might say the mind changes a lot. True, but the mind changes into mind, thoughts into other thoughts. And the eyes, I could see well, now I need glasses. All these changes are known by the mind. But my point here is very simple. The mind and the eyes are different. Not just the eyes, the ears and the nose and, and the rest of the body. Something different because the mind is the knower and the body is the known. This is stage two. Mind knower and the body is known, including the eyes. Go deeper, further. The mind itself, is it known? Can you experience your mind? Yes, we do. All the time. I'm happy. That's an experience of the mind. I cannot remember. That's an experience of the mind. The, the working of the memory, the failure of the memory, all of these are experiences of the mind. I want this. I like this. I dislike it. These are experiences of the mind. So the mind is known. Now it gets interesting. The mind is known. But by our principle, the known and the known, the seer and the seen must be different. That which knows the mind must be in some sense different from the mind. Something subtler than the mind, which experiences the mind. What do I mean by experiencing the mind? Just now think a thought. Just close your eyes, think. You know, the mind is always thinking thoughts, and if you tell it, think a thought, it sits blank, can't think of anything. Just think two plus two, four. Two plus two is four. Or I'm sitting in, uh, uh, in a university. And that thought, note the experience of thinking that thought. You are aware of the thought. The thought is not aware of you. You never think in this way. Clearly, when you think about it, 2 plus 2, 4, it's a thought. You are aware. I am aware of the thought. 2 plus 2, 4 is not aware of me. So, thoughts in the mind are objects to an awareness from within. That awareness, for lack of a better word, it is called the witness. The witness in Sanskrit, Sakshi. That witness is the real consciousness. This is what we are talking about. This consciousness and the rest are objects. What are objects? The external world is an object. Body is an object. Why an object? Because you are aware of it. Even the breath is an object. <coughs> are you aware of the breath? Yes. There is a whole industry of mindfulness meditation dependent on the fact that you can be aware of the breath. I'm breathing in, I am aware, I am breathing in, breathing out. So. Subtler than the breath, the mind, thoughts, emotions. Yes, we are aware. There's a word for it, introspection. You look inside, you are aware of your own thoughts and feelings. That which is aware of all of these, that is called the witness. That is what Vedanta means by consciousness. Step one. What is that witness? Can we experience it just like we experienced everything else? Actually not. The fourth stage of this, you might be thinking, what are the first three stages? Remember, very simple. External object, seen by the eye. Stage one, eye and the object are different. Stage two, eyes themselves, seen by the mind. Mind and the eyes are different. Stage three, mind itself, seen by something within the mind. And that witness of the mind must be different from the mind. That witness is consciousness. I'm inviting you to experience it for yourself. It's always there, but we don't note it in that way. We don't think about it that way. It is in fact you. What Vedanta says, the real you is not the body. The body changes. The real you is not even the mind. The mind changes. Every day the night it disappears in, in deep sleep. But the real you is this consciousness which we are claiming in Vedanta is not the mind or the body. It is something apart from the mind and body which experiences the mind and through the mind experiences the body and through the body mind experiences the world. And that consciousness, that impersonal principle, it's like light. Uh, to give a gross example, it's, uh, that is what we are. And that one never becomes an object of experience. Grigeva Natrutrishyate in Sanskrit, the seer, the witness, never becomes an object. Because as you can see, if the witness becomes an object, who is witnessing that? The witness then. So the witness itself never becomes an object. It is an unchanged, like an unchanging light is there. Even this is not Advaita. This is the first step. This is basically this position, Sankhya. Consciousness apart from its objects. Now I tell you to the last part of the presentation and stop there. What Advaita says is, it starts where Sankhya stops. 
the philosophy of Samkhya, or what panpsychism, very good stuff. Now Advaita asks a question. What is the relationship between consciousness and its objects? What is the relationship? Are they two different entities? Is it like light and these objects? These objects, if you switch up the light, these objects would still be there. If you remove the objects, the light would still be there. So the light and the objects are different. How do you know two things are different when you can experience them separately? Though they seem to go together, if you can experience them separately, the pen without the cap and the cap without the pen, then you know they're two independent entities, but usually together. So are, is consciousness and its objects, are they independent entities? As panpsychism or Sankhya would suggest? The answer this given is pretty, is direct and devastating. How would you know that objects exist apart from consciousness? Because you cannot know anything without consciousness. And I have long arguments with people about this. There's a, there's a gentleman who's 95 years old, he's a physicist, and he just can't swallow this point. So he says, he came up with a thought experiment. Swami, you keep a video recorder in the room and then we all leave the room. There's nobody conscious in the room. But the video recorder records the existence of the room anyway. So when you come back and see, the room was existing. You don't require consciousness for the existence of the objects. This is the whole old, you know, in philosophy, if you read, idealism, subjective idealism. Berkeley was, uh, not the university, the philosopher. Berkeley was the person who talked about this in the West. But this was a school of philosophy, a Buddhist school of philosophy thousands of years ago. It is called Vijnana Vada Buddhism, subjective idealist Buddhism. Now, how would you know that conscious, the objects exist apart from consciousness? What about that experiment? You can take pictures with that camera and all of us leave the room, later on you will see the room existed. But the, my answer to that physicist was, that camera and the experiment and seeing the room existed without any other living beings, all of that is in consciousness, isn't it? That's what you are seeing, right? You are experiencing it in your consciousness. All this would not even arise if consciousness was not there. So this leads the Advaitin to make a very radical claim that the objects of consciousness are not independent entities apart from consciousness. They arise in consciousness. Remember, I stress this again and again. When I say such things, people, if you've not studied philosophy, good for you. If you study philosophy, immediately the mistake they make is, are you proposing some kind of idealism that we are imagining this word, it's in our mind. Vedanta does not say it's in the mind. What Vedanta wants to say is, Advaita, even the mind is an appearance in consciousness. It's not that we are thinking the universe into existence. That the mind and whatever it thinks of, all of them arise and disappear in consciousness. Both subject and object are appearances in consciousness and they disappear back into consciousness. So, According to Vedanta, the objects of consciousness are not independent entities. They are consciousness themselves appearing as objects in names and forms, different names and forms. I'll end with a story. I still have enough time, but I'll use the time for q and I'll end with this story. It's a children's story, but I liked it so much. Um, Alan Watts, not very popular these days, but people don't know about him. But he was very popular in the Bay Area about in the 1960s, I think, before long before my time. Um, very witty, slightly mischievous. <laughs> uh, there's this book, this, The Taboo Against Knowing What You Are. The Taboo Against Knowing What You Are. A tiny book, I recommend it. So it's his take on Advaita and Buddhism. These are the two things he popularized. At that time, it was Zen which was more popular than Tibetan Buddhism. So he popularized that. In that book, oh by the way, he says, to give, a, uh, give an example of his wit, he says, if religion is the, is the opium of the masses, then I must say that the Hindus have the inside dope. <laughs> uh, he says, to explain this theory. He says, a children's tale. Now, God alone existed. For the purposes of this, you have to replace God with consciousness. So God alone existed. 
from eternity to eternity. But after some time, you know, he got bored. There's nothing, nothing else except God. So he wanted to play. And, but there's nobody else to play with because there's nobody else exists other than God. So he thought about it, what can I do? And because he's God, he's very intelligent. So he hit upon a solution. God pretended to be not God. God pretended to be not God. And now he has somebody to play with, God and not God. But the problem arose that because he's God and he's awfully good at doing what he does, when he pretended to be not God, he thoroughly, thoroughly pretended to be not God and forgot that he was God. <laughs> and from that time onwards, not God, God has not God has been searching for himself. And this is what samsara is, this universe is that. We're basically God pretending to be not God and trying to find himself. And that's the hide and seek between God and God pretending to be not God. I found that a very nice uh, uh, way of putting Advaita, in a very simple and funny way, but very, very interesting. So the conclusion of this is, uh, the takeaway, the Advaita view of consciousness is, consciousness is, a, is the fundamental reality. And you are it. And everything in the universe is a manifestation of this fundamental reality called consciousness. Would you want to ask questions at this point? Reactions, questions? Hmm? Yes. So I have uh, one observation and one question. Yes. So uh, when you were. Could you tell us your name? You want to give me the camera? Okay. My name is Pratik Rai, yes. and uh, the observation I had was when you were talking about fundamental objects and parasitism, you just tap that podium and say that that doesn't have con consciousness. Yes. And when we think of the other fundamental quantities from a science point of view, and we talk about matter and energy and space, all of the non-living things have them. Right? Uh, all of the non-living things have? Do, uh, can be described uh, in terms of mass. Yes. In terms of space. Right. And they persist over time. Right. Uh, at least to an extent. Right. So in that way, uh, if consciousness is a fundamental uh, entity, yes. it is slightly different from the ones that the scientists talk about. Has to so that's just observation. Right, right. Uh, the question is, uh, when you talk about consciousness in the uh, Advaita philosophy, mm -hmm. I was kind of getting confused between consciousness and Atman. So could yes. you please explain that? It's exactly Atman. Literally the word Atman in Advaita or in Indian philosophy. In Atman, the word Atman just means self, you. So when Advaita Vedanta says, Atman, in, in the original terms used by Advaita Vedanta, Atman is Brahman. Tattvamasi, that thou art. Thou, you are the self. And you are that ultimate reality of the universe. But then the whole process of teaching in Advaita Vedanta starts this way. That when we look at ourselves, I don't seem to be a fundamental reality of the universe. I am just this, I'm just this guy. So then Advaita starts with asking you, what do you think about yourself? What do you think you are? We start with the body. Most obviously we'll say this. And then Advaita will, uh, will guide you step by step. I used one procedure. But there are other procedures. There is Pancha Kosha Vedeka. Basically what they'll do is, they'll take up the body first and show you why you cannot be the body based on your own experiences. And there are many reasons they will give. And it's not just an, inter in, uh, an intellectual argument, but also experientially see that it is true. You're not the body. In the same way, they will go deeper. You cannot be the mind also for those same reasons. And therefore, you are that which is clearly you cannot deny that you are experiencing. So what you are, whatever you are, must be in some sense aware, sentient, conscious, because you are having these experiences. So you are consciousness itself. They come to the understanding, Atman is consciousness. And this Atman, this consciousness, is the basis of the entire universe. For the second reason, I explained that. Then what is the relationship between this Atman and the rest of the universe? But to answer your question directly, what is the relationship between Atman and Consciousness? According to Advaita Vedanta, Atman is Consciousness. Not that Atman is conscious. Consciousness itself is the Atman. You are Consciousness and Consciousness only. Yeah. How 